Thank you very much, dear Minister, dear Josef, dear Michael, dear honourable members of the European Parliament and National Parliaments, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. It's a real pleasure to be here after two years again with you. And I must say at the beginning, thank you for the music. It was great. Did you hear how much of passion and love was in the music? There was no hatred, no negative emotion. There was just love and passion. And I can tell you, I think that Mr. Beethoven is, was now dancing in his grave because to hear out of joy in this worldwide spirit and, and the tones of diversity was in it, it, it was really fantastic. And I think that now uh, the people, not only in Europe, uh, they make their minds according to or, or the ba basis of emotions. And many of them are driven by negative emotions. That's why we need music, we need art, we need people who can uh, do such magic to bring positive emotions. And I think it's also the task for ourselves. Uh, let me, am I destroying the translation? Oh, they are really, they are really writing what I'm saying in my English. <laughs> Let's try it together, yes. Uh, but to be serious, uh, I was listening very carefully what Michael O'Flaherty said. Of course, he reminded us of our debate two years ago. And you said, Michael, that we are living in bad times. Now I will mobilize the maximum of my positive thinking. And I will say, we are living in good times because for us, the people who work for human rights and who are the defenders, defenders' rights, now it's our moment uh, because now we must say to ourselves, there is a job to do. Now, maybe not 10 years ago when it seemed to be business as usual, we have achieved it. Let's do something else. No, now we have a job to do. And we politicians, the journalists, the opinion leaders, the people who care, they have to go to the market with their skin and to speak clearly that human rights are the things that matter. And it reminded me of uh, Jan Patočka, the great Czech philosopher who died in 1977 after a cruel uh, state police uh, hearing. Uh, he had the dilemma and the long-lasting issue. What are the things which really matter, which are worth suffering? And I think that now the question is more actual and more urgent than, than ever before. Uh, these are the matters which are worth suffering. And of course, also, we have to count with negative reactions. We live in digital era and online world is very harsh sometimes and very cruel. Let's be ready to be the targets of attacks. Let's suffer. Let's undertake this risk because these are the things which really matter. And you here in the audience are the platinum members of the Fundamental Rights Club. It's largely thanks to your work and dedication that the European Union is probably the best place in the world when it comes to the legislation and enforcement of fundamental rights. This year we honor the legacy of already mentioned here uh, Dr. Martin Luther King as we commemorated the 50th anniversary of his death. And I think Dr. King would be proud to know that in the EU fundamental rights, the compass of justice 
have a Bible, which is the Charter for Fundamental Rights. The Charter for Fundamental Rights is an example of hard work where we identified together a common set of values. So it means the things that really matter. Values to guide our actions and to enable us to live together in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice and equality prevail. Every day in the European Union we can find examples that the Charter is not fully applied in real life. Stories that our host, the Fundamental Rights Agency, has collected, like the one from Peter, a young German man, are just a reminder of this. He said, the anti-Semitic insults I have experienced were neither from neo-Nazis nor from leftists, but from ordinary people of the political center. And this is a scary confession because it does unfortunately fit with the recent trends in Europe. The bad version of nationalism, the one promoting exclusion and hatred is on the rise. And so is racial abuse and discrimination. According to the latest data, we have worrying data. There are roughly four anti-Semitic incidents per day, four per day in France, United Kingdom, and Germany. Hate online is on the rise. And these dangerous trends are not only visible in the rising popularity of the extreme parties. Sadly, the mainstream parties accept some part of this rhetoric of division as well. It means that exclusion, discrimination, and lack of respect for minorities have spilled over from the margins to the center and don't meet enough resistance from the media, politicians or opinion leaders. Nationalists marching in Chemnitz, anti soros campaigners in Hungary, or growing anti-Muslim or anti-Roma rhetoric are just a few examples that show that despite the charter, despite a strong legal framework and de dedicated people like yourself, we have a real and serious problem. Even though I am sure that everyone here will be able to recite from the Charter, even when woken up in the middle of the night, we shouldn't assume that everyone reads the Charter as a bedtime story. We have to translate the Charter into basic principles that really matter, that are not negotiable, but they, that people in Europe can also relate to and that the people in Europe can understand. These basic principles should become an anchor in this fast-changing, confusing world, simply the bedrock of our society. For me, how I understand them, they are for instance, equality in front of the law, no tolerance for discrimination, but also not the fight against discrimination that discriminates others. Freedom of speech, but with limits to exclude, for instance, speech calling for violence and killing. Freedom of religion, within the limits of the legal order. Access to justice for all, not only for the privileged or the rich ones. And finally, the right of feeling secure, safe, but not at the expense of safety of others. These principles can only work if they are applied and visible in people's everyday lives. For that to happen, the Charter rights and the bulk of EU legislation that directly promotes fundamental rights must be implemented. They must be translated into real people's life. In this regard, there have been a number of initiatives. For example, the Framework Decision on Racism and Xenophobia, celebrating its 10th anniversary this year, or the Victims' Rights Directive, the Fair Trial Package, the new data 
EU, EU data protection rules, the initiatives on work-life balance and gender pay gap, the equality directives, the EU accession to the Istanbul Convention or prevent, on preventing and combating violence against women and children, the proposed directive on the protection of whistleblowers, the soon-to-be-adopted audiovisual media service directive. Next to the legislation and enforcement, we must also continue to develop policies that foster and promote our fundamental rights and values. During my mandate, I have witnessed the effectiveness of the platforms of EU, national and international experts and civil society working together to combat hate crime, discrimination and intolerance and to foster equality. These joint efforts have led to good progress on some of the key challenges that we face. Let me just name three examples. First, a significant curb to illegal hate speech online, thanks to the implementation of the code of conduct agreed with the IT companies two years ago. IT companies are now removing on average 70% of content notified to them, and in more than 80% of the cases, they do it in less than 24 hours. When we were discussing with the IT industry, we wanted and were following one goal. We have to achieve the situation when the law which applies offline must also apply apply online. And to say it in a harsh way, if we enable jungle in online world, we will soon have jungle in real world. It was 2016, it was the year which Michael spoke about, the, the, the dark picture. We knew we have to act. That's why we agreed on this code of conduct with the IT companies. And we knew that if we start to plan the legislation, we would not be ready now. It would not be adopted. So that's why I find this code of conduct as a success story and as a result of a good agreement with the digital industry, which I will share with you my personal opinion, which have still the managers and owners who understand our values and who say we are the part of the problem, so we have to be part of the solution. The second initiative, an improvement of national systems for recording and collecting equality data and data on hate crimes. This is the area where fundamental rights agency support has been decisive. <clears throat> I have becoming the voice like Amanda Lear, do you remember her? But I will do it all, don't worry, still a little bit of speaking. Third initiative, a compilation of promising practices and guiding principles on key issues such as hate crime training and hate crime victims support. The work, of course, is not finished, including the legislative bit. In particular, the digitalization of our lives will call for new solutions. Yeah, thank you. I thought this is for flowers, so I didn't touch it. <laughs> so what are our plans now? In particular, the digitalization of our lives will call for new solutions. I think you all will agree with me. Just think of artificial intelligence, for instance. It's not a technological story. It's a story of people, of the future of people. There will be presented ethical guidelines on artificial intelligence development at the end of this year. And our European approach to artificial intelligence relies on keeping the human being in the center and ensuring that fundamental values are built into its design. I will say it in a more concrete way. You know that the development of artificial intelligence depends a lot of harvesting of private data of people. And we see China 
very high, very intensively developing United States, we seem to be lagging behind. But we don't want to follow the way of China or United States, which is based, in my view, on unscrupulous harvesting of private data of people. We want to do it our European way, which I said with the human being in the center. I'm sure the historian will say that we were right. Now let me speak about several things that scare me, especially about what some call the identity politics based on exclusive nationalism. I myself lived in totalitarian regime where there was only one right ideology, only one right government, and only one allowed discourse. Minor minorities didn't exist. Diversity of views and opinions were not respected. People did not dare to speak up. This exclusive nationalism tries to force people to define themselves against others and implies that being a part of majority makes us somehow better. This attitude gives rise to hatred, violence, discrimination and closes any reasonable space for dialogue. We have to try to understand why people are turning to such a vision of the world despite our tragic and not so distant history, especially in Europe, and why the discourse is no longer the exclusive rhetoric of fringe and extreme parties. Therefore, we are not addressing fringe voters, voters but more and more the mainstream. This is a discussion in our living rooms. The reasons are very complex. But I would argue that the predominant source of this is simply fear. When we are afraid, we often switch off rational thinking and escape to our instincts, even the darkest ones. I don't think we should respond to this fear by lecturing, by being ignorant or by ridiculing the fact that the people fear is a serious thing for us, for all the politicians. This is not how we can build a real relationship. This is the way we are losing people and pushing them away from our core principles. We have to try to understand the reasons and offer a familiar alternative. In my view, we should promote healthy patriotism based on inclusion, but also about nurturing the feeling of familiar community. Václav Havel described what I mean when he talked about the relationship between the Czech Republic and Europe. He said, if I feel European, it doesn't mean I have stopped being a Czech. It is the opposite. As a Czech, I am also a European poetically said, Europe is motherland of our motherlands. This is how I feel as well in this job of the commissioner, where I must not take any instructions and any uh, directions from my own country. This is a special job, but I feel it very strongly that by doing this job as a Czech person, I can be the Czech patriot and still European. So here I would point out to the particular role that politicians, media and digitalization have both in spreading the disease of exclusion and as well as in fighting it. Let me say a few words about us politicians. We are heard. Our opinions influence the society. We have access to mass media and a large group of society is influenced by what we say. In democracy, irresponsible politicians can easily take advantage of the freedom of speech by using fear for their political gains. Calling media the enemies of the people or blaming an individual 
or a minority group for migration or economic misfortune are not examples from the 1930s, but unfortunately from our recent memory. And I appeal to politicians, to all of us, to show responsibility for our words and to show restraint. We have to realize that our words become justification for some people to act on their urges and their fears. Now, media. Media have an equally important role to play, not only because it is thanks to the media that the words of politicians can be heard or read by millions. Media build the culture of dialogue, or should build the culture of dialogue. On the contrary, we see divisions spread disinformation and encourage exclusion. The Brexit debate is the best example of that. Again, do you remember the front page of a popular British daily calling the judges the enemy of the people? Or just last week, the EU leaders were called dirty rats on another front page. Almost daily, we could find examples of stories that are spiced up to identify an enemy, to paint the picture black and white. Traditional media are under enormous pressure from the digital world. They lose readership and advertising revenue. They have to cut stuff, which means less fact-checking, less quality reporting. And I would advocate for a European approach to media based on quality and smart regulation, if needed. In Europe, we have a dual system in the area of broadcasting, combining the presence of public broadcasters with commercial broadcasters. We need to keep up our support for public broadcasters and independent media more broadly than just following the laws of markets. And fundamental rights must be a part of public discourse in the media. They have to belong to the media. Media are very instrumental in holding politicians to account and in defining the limits of what is unacceptable in a society. Michael reminded of, us of two horrible murders of two brave people, Daphne, Karuna, Galicia and Jan Kuciak. Uh, I was in Malta and I, was, I visited the cemetery of, and the grave of Daphne. There I had the opportunity to meet her parents, her son, her husband and her sisters. And I had a chat with her, with her son on that set moment, on that set place. And he's also a journalist. And I said to him, well, I have a strange feeling that if your mother is alive, we two could not be friends. I am a politician and she's a journalist. We would not go together to have a coffee and friendly, girly chat. But it's not our role to be friends with journalists. We both have to do responsibly our job. And we should respect the role of media because they do the job which is very often uncomfortable for us politicians, but we have to respect their incredibly crucial role for the democracy and freedom of speech. And finally, the digital revolution we are witnessing. This is probably the biggest source of change in our lives. I don't blame the digital and social media for invention of fake news or disinformation, but often without any filters, they allow the massive spread of dubious sources and create the pretense of immunity. Just look at the election, US presidential elections, Brexit referendum and the Cambridge Analytica case. These events helped us realize that modern technology can be used by private or foreign interests to take the advantage of our digital presence and to manipulate our elections. This is why the European Commission adopted the package of measures to secure free and fair 
European elections. That's why we work. The work started with the code of conduct needs to continue. The work we are doing to fight discrimination, including publication of a code of practice in a week's time, needs to be effective. Here I speak about the code of practice which relates to fake news and disinformation. We need to renew a societal contract that confirms basic principles and fundamental rights for the digital age. Only this can sustain people's trust in it and avoid that they lose faith in our democracies and societies. Dear ministers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am afraid we are in an existential period for our societies and for the future of European Union and European integration. But as the Vienna born Karl Popper said, an open society can only be maintained if we are willing to fight for it. And fight we must, but we have to fight smart. We have to remember that the world is not black and white and we have to keep up our both feet firmly on the ground. We must humbly ask the people to trust us again and promote the hope the Charter brings. I understand this as embracing people's fears, showing empathy and going out there, out of our comfortable bubbles, to try to show to people that fundamental rights belong to everyone and that they mean a lot in practice. We need to renew ownership for fundamental rights and values and renew our societal contract for what they mean and for what they stand for. Thank you very much.